Hey, Cindy and Lindley and also Paul, I can see are here. Uh, my name is Billy. I'm from the Child Cancer Foundation and we have our wonderful uh, Dr. Raffaele Van Litzenberg. Um, I just want to uh, again uh, say hello and welcome um, uh, Raffaele for, uh, to the Child Cancer Foundation family. Um, Tonight's an awesome night, a uh, night where we can learn about sleep. Um, and I just want to introduce um, you to our attendees who are watching. So um, Dr. Raffaele van Witzenberg um, is from the uh, Princess Maxima Center of Pediatric Oncology. Um, and hey, we're really lucky to be able to connect up with you and reach out to you all the way from the Netherlands. Um, and it's 8.30 in the morning where you are at. So again, thank you so much for extending your time out to us uh, to be able to um, inform us and educate us around our sleep. And so I understand that you've had a lot of publications around um, sleep research in pediatric oncology, um, sleep rhythms, patterns, sleep disturbances, and also uh, a whole lot around parental sleep patterns and the impacts of that on children and also uh, the effects of um, on sleep um, on children who are going through treatment and also post-treatment. So we're really fortunate to be able to um, have you to share your knowledge with us. So thank you again. Welcome. Um, and yeah, over to you. Thank you, Pelia. Nice to meet you. Um, welcome to everyone. I'm happy to uh, um, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to talk about sleep to you. It's one of my passions. Um, so I'm a, I'm a pediatrician and a fellow in pediatric oncology. Um, and um, I'm really interested in sleep because I think it's been underestimated in our care for children with cancer. Um, so that's why I'm really happy to talk about it. And um, if you have any questions, I thought maybe we can keep them uh, until the end of the presentation. And then I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, um, I was going to say this morning, but for you this evening, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the history about uh, my sleep research in pediatric oncology. Um, and then I would like to uh, talk to you about regulation of sleep because I think it's essential to know a little bit about regulation of sleep in order to um, understand why we give certain advices. Um, and then, of course, over to um, sleep in children with cancer. So um, uh, what type of sleep problems do we see? Who experience sleep problems? What can we do about it? And that's the final part of my uh, presentation. Uh, I want to talk to you about potential solution um, in children with sleep problems. Um, so first a little bit about um, my history in sleep research. Um, I studied quality of life in children with leukemia about 10 or 15 years ago. And um, well, you won't be surprised it's surprised to see these graphics. So um, they show physical and psychosocial quality of life during treatment for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And the dotted black line are healthy Dutch children. Uh, so you can see that uh, over time during treatment, quality of life gets better, but still at the end of treatment, it's still impaired, uh, not surprisingly. Um, and, but the m most important aim of this study was to see if we could identify certain factors that uh, could um, um, give us opportunities to improve quality of life. Um, and um, we found several uh, factors that are related to a lower quality of life. It's the intensity of treatment, uh, complications due to treatment or certain types of medication, for example, uh, uh, corticosteroids, uh, mostly dexamethasone. Some of you might uh, be familiar with it. It's very infamous for its uh, um, associated behavioral and sleep difficulties. Um, and talking to parents, um, I noticed that they often 
slightly dropped the fact that their child slept badly. And I thought, well, this is interesting because uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't learn a lot about sleep during my studies. So I tried to find some, um, some uh, scientific evidence on sleep in children with cancer, but it was almost non-existent. So in 2011, we did a very small study to see um, if there are indeed sleep problems in children with cancer and, and how they relate to quality of life. And well, they related exactly in the way that you would assume they would. So um, we saw that children with cancer had a lot of sleep problems and that those children um, had a lower quality of life than, than children with cancer that didn't report sleep problems. So sleep seemed like a very interesting um, and potential way to help improve quality of life because it's more difficult to, um, to change things in the treatment regime because of course um, uh, we don't want to take any risks there. So the next questions were, well, what type of sleep problems um, do children experience and who is most at risk and do they go away when treatment is over? And of course, what can we do about the sleep problems? Well, and of course, it's very important to have good sleep. And I think um, um, we can all relate to the fact that if you sleep badly, uh, you're very tired. And uh, sleep is especially important with children with cancer because we know that they are already at risk for complications and late effects. And sleep is not only related to fatigue, but it's also related, I'm sorry, to problems with memory and attention. Uh, poor sleep is also related to higher levels of distress, anxiety, and depression. Um, and it's also very important for, for you, parents of children with cancer, because we know that if you sleep poorly, it's much more difficult to make these difficult decisions about the medical treatment uh, of your child. And finally, in the long run, we know that chronic sleep deprivation is related to obesity and cardiovascular disease. And these are all reasons uh, for me to advocate for more attention to sleep in uh, pediatric oncology. So um, I'm coming to the part where I would like to tell you a little bit about how sleep is regulated. So there are two main processes. It, there's the circadian rhythm which determines when your body is awake and when it wants to sleep. And it's more or less a 24 hour rhythm. And then there's sleep pressure. So the longer that you are awake, the more sleep pressure will accumulate. And sleep pressure makes you feel sleepy. And when sleep pressure is high and your circadian rhythm is also announcing to your body that it's time to sleep, that's the moment when you will feel the maximum amount of sleepiness. And this is the best time to fall asleep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, and you can see here that if you take a nap in the middle of the day, if you're healthy and you're, and you're adult, your sleep pressure will go down until the moment that you wake up again, then it will start to accumulate. But then if you go to bed at the same time as usual, you will see that uh, your sleepiness is not as high because your sleep pressure has not had the chance to build up to the maximum level. And then something similar happens if you wake up during the night. So your sleep pressure was going down because you were sleeping, then you wake up and it will rise again until you fall back asleep. And when the alarm clock goes in the morning, you feel less rested because you already have accumulated a little bit of sleep pressure. Um, of course, this, this applies again if you are uh, healthy and, and you're adults, but in very young children, if you're, if you're ill, napping during the day has less impact because your sleep pressure rises faster. You need more sleep to feel rested. So the circadian rhythm I talked about in a previous slide is regulated by the central clock and it, that is located uh, deep inside of the brain um, and it not only regulates sleep but also a lot of other processes in the body for example temperature and blood pressure and when bowel movements are made and it's all uh, uh, regulated clockwise and, and uh, um, uh, regulated centrally deep inside the brain and 
also on a, uh, um, deep inside the brain is the pineal gland, uh, which uh, produces the sleep hormone melatonin. And the pineal gland is also controlled by this central clock that's uh, deep inside the brain. So they, they are in close relationship to each other. And melatonin regulates the sleep-wake rhythm. And all these circadian rhythms need to be regulated in order to stay in sync with the outside world. And the most important regulator of the circadian rhythm is light. And uh, there have been some interesting studies, I think in the 60s or 70s, where people went to live in a, in a cave without light. Um, and um, if, there, if there's no light and no, any, no routine, your own circadian rhythm will get out of sync because it's a bit longer than 24 hours. So if you stay in a dark cave long enough, your circadian rhythm will be desynchronized with the outside world. But if there's also routine, so for example, those people in the cave, if they were brought dinner every evening at six and they were woken up every morning at seven, uh, your own circadian rhythm was still able to be synchronized to our 24-hour normal rhythm. So uh, light and routines are very important for your own biological rhythm to be in sync with the outside world. So it takes a little while for the sleep-wake system to mature. As, so I'm sure you're all, all familiar with the fact that, of course, newborn have a very patchy sleep-wake rhythm. So they sleep in uh, short times during the day and they're also often awake at night. And it takes a little while for your circadian rhythm and your secretion of melatonin to get to a more adult level uh, where you finally uh, reach the age let's say around kindergarten age, that you don't need any uh, daytime napping anymore and you can sleep for a whole night uh, um, without waking up. Um, this is because uh, your melatonin production gets a more robust circadian rhythm and also because as you grow up, you are more able to withstand the accumulation of sleep pressure and your need for sleep also decreases. So that's why as, as you mature from a, a school age child to an adult, you need less hours of sleep. Well, this development from a napping and fragmented nighttime sleep does not necessarily happen by itself. There is this old famous Dutch saying that uh, is here in a typically Dutch style, and it literally translates to rest, cleanliness, and regularity. And I always like to use this to illustrate to parents that I, I talk to um, what is important for young children to learn how to sleep well. Well, I'm sure you all recognize that rest is important because an overly tired child will not easily settle down. So rest is important, but it at the same time doesn't mean that children shouldn't be physically active. Physically active is very important for your sleep-wake rhythm, just not too close to bedtime, because if you're too active right for bedtime, you will not be able to find rest. And of course, the sleep environment has to be calm as well. Not too many noises, not too many other disturbances, and you need your sleep environment to be dark, to nudge your circadian rhythm to know that it's time to sleep. And regularity is key. I showed you earlier that routines are key cues for the synchronization of your own circadian rhythm. So it really helps to have a predictable bedtime routine, to go to bed uh, about the same time every night and to be consistent. Well then, parents ask me, what about cleanliness? What does that mean? Well, I'm not sure. It's something that's, it's an old saying, but um, one of the things that could help to cue your own circadian rhythm is a warm bath before going to bed. Um, and the reason is that um, when your body temperature drops, it's a sign to your circadian rhythm that it's time to sleep. If you take a warm bath and you get out, then you will cool down. 
Uh, so you're relaxed because of the warm bath and then your body temperature drops when you get out and it's a cue to your circadian rhythm that it's sleep time. So sleep is really something that children need to learn. Um, just like they need to learn how to walk, how to eat or how to be on the body. And some children, they don't need a lot of guidance and the same thing applies to learning how to eat. But some children really need parental guidance to uh, um, learn how to sleep well. So this is an important developmental task for children and it's often, I think, overlooked. Uh, and uh, so you, can, you shouldn't assume that it would go automatically. So you've learned your young child how to sleep. Yay, you're happy and then they hit puberty. Um, and of course, um, in puberty, a lot of things change uh, as does the uh, sleep-wake rhythm. So what you see is a shift in circadian rhythm to a more adult type. So this means that teenagers get sleepy later in the evening. On one hand, because the circadian rhythm, so the production of melatonin shifts to a later time. But of course, uh, they also have a lot of activities in the evening. Uh, they need to do homework, they want to meet friends, they have sports and so on. Um, so that shifts their bedtime, let's say from eight o'clock when they're a young child to midnight. Um, in the evening and that of course means that they want to sleep in because even though their circadian rhythm in uh, teenagers shifts to an adult time they still need more hours of sleep to be able to restore fully to be able to um, bring their sleep pressure down so the um, the average adolescent still needs about nine hours of sleep but of course if you go to bed at midnight and you need to go to school in the morning, this is a problem. So a lot of teenagers, so this is a normal phenomenon, a lot of teenagers don't have any problems if they can sleep in, for, for example, on weekends or uh, during the holidays. But when they have to get up early, it's a problem. And uh, this is something that we see in a lot of teenagers, healthy teenagers, but also in teenagers with cancer, is that they have this very inconsistent bedtime. And so in the weekends they sleep for a long time in the morning and then on Monday they need to get up early. So moving on to sleep in children with cancer. Um, we did a national study on um, the development of sleep and sleep problems in children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So we followed them from uh, a couple of months after the start of treatment until three years later, which is for most of the children, it's their one year after the end of treatment. So we saw during treatment that sleep problems were about twice as common compared to uh, uh, children their own age with, without cancer. Um, and we expected the number of sleep problems to decline after treatment ended. But actually it didn't. So um, this was for me, even though I'm, I'm, well, it was still a little bit surprising. Um, and we did a, another study in teenagers that were, had also finished their uh, anti-cancer treatments. And um, we saw similar results in the teenagers uh, that about a quarter of them still reported sleep problems even though they uh, were done with their treatments. And the majority of teenagers reported complaints of insomnia. So that means that they had problems either falling asleep or sleeping through the night. Well, then, of course, if we want to be able to help these children as best as we can, we need to understand which children are most at risk for sleep problems. So. Um, some of the risk factors are becoming clearer and clearer. First, there's the type and the location of the tumor. And you can imagine that if you have a tumor that's in the region that um, controls your circadian rhythm, for example, a type of brain tumor that's called craniopharyngioma, um, that you're more at risk of developing sleep problems. Also, if you've been treated in that area, for example, with ra radiation, uh, but also certain types of uh, medications like dexamethasone, which I mentioned previously, 
uh, are known for uh, um, uh, their associated sleep problems. And during treatment, there are a lot of um, factors that can be uh, uh, problematic for good sleep. Of course, if, if you experience pain, it's difficult to sleep. If you are very worried or anxious, if you have a lot of nausea. Uh, and interestingly, we also found that if the parents are very overwhelmed with everything that happens, children report more sleep problems. Um, and that's because, of course, some children need their parents to sleep well, and it's more difficult to create, create the best circumstances if you're overwhelmed. Um, we also zoomed in on sleep at the hospital because some children spend a long time there and they are not known to be very sleep friendly environments. So um, during admissions to the hospital, uh, children wake up on average 14 times a, a night when they're admitted to a pediatric oncology ward and um, uh, personnel comes in the room very often. So between three and 22 times per night. Um, but we know that the most disruptive to sleep seem to be electronic noises, for example, from heart monitors or from infusion pumps. Um, and we looked at that at our hospital uh, in children that were admitted for elective chemotherapy. Their infusion pumps sounded about five times per night on average for about nine minutes in total. So um, that's... that's um, a problem, of course, if you uh, want to sleep well. Um, there are also certain uh, um, um, risk factors that are related to the child itself or to the family. For example, we've seen multiple times in our study that children that have not only cancer, but an additional chronic illness are more at risk to experience sleep problems also in the longer run, so also after the treatment for cancer has ended, and children that are less physically active. We also see more problems in very young children and in older adolescents. Um, and I have to say this is similar in healthy children, as is the fact that girls experience more sleep problems than boys. It's, it's the same in healthy children as well. And again, if, if you as a parent experience difficulties parenting or if you uh, experience high levels of stress or sleep badly yourself, it's also more difficult to help your child sleep well. I would like to zoom in a little bit on the risk factors for insomnia, so problems with falling asleep or staying asleep, which were uh, reported uh, most commonly by our teenagers. Um, and um, so here in this graph, you see um, um, the insomnia severity and uh, the development over time. Um, and some people in general are more prone than others to develop uh, insomnia. So they have certain predisposing factors and they can be genetic, for example. Uh, then uh, that doesn't mean that you will develop insomnia, it just makes you more vulnerable to it. And insomnia is often triggered by a highly stressful event. And um, of course, in our population, this would be a diagnosis of cancer. In most people, in most teenagers, uh, fortunately, um, it, will, uh, it will subside the insomnia complaint, as you can see here in the uh, purple graphic. Uh, but in, a, in a, a minority of children, insomnia will continue after the high stress has subsided a little bit. And um, um, that means that there are perpetuating factors at play. And we know that ongoing distress, for example, worries, uh, for example, about recurrences, uh, or a lack of, a healthy, uh, of healthy sleep habits and lack of a healthy sleep routine, uh, like irregular bedtime or continuing to nap when your body does not really need it anymore or a lot of screen use before bedtime can be important perpetuating factors for insomnia complaints. So what are some tips and tricks to tackle uh, sleep problems? 
Uh, well, for any type of sleep problem, the first step is always to try to improve your sleep habits. And here again is regularity and rest. So it's important to prime your body as much as possible to go to sleep. So this has to do with your own biological clock and the start of the circadian rhythm. So going to bed every, every night at about the same time helps because your body will be cued to the fact that you go to bed at, let's say, 8 p.m. Uh, and so it also helps to have a very predictable bedtime routine because it will help your body to recognize the cues of going to bed and falling asleep. Of course, children that are too wound up or that are prone to worrying, they might also need some help in calming down and getting their bodies into sleep mode. So here again, a strict and regular routine will help. Um, and uh, quiet activities such as reading a book or coloring or whatever the child likes to do um, uh, might help in that aspect. Or maybe take a warm bath as part of the uh, cueing the body for going to sleep. And of course, you need to make sure that the sleep pressure is high enough. So be physically active during the day, but not too close to nighttime. Well, light, as you remember, is one of the most important regulator of the circadian rhythm. So make sure that your child is exposed to light during the day, especially go out in the morning because it will help you get your body activated and make it dark at night. And if your child is frightened, it's fine to put in a bed light, but it shouldn't be too bright. And uh, last but not least, no screens before bedtime if, if your child has trouble sleeping. Um, because on one hand, they might get a bit excited about what's on the screen. So it might be computer games or being on social media or whatever they do on the screens. Uh, but the blue light that is emitted by the screens, it can also influence your biological clock and make it think that, you know, it's not bedtime because there's light coming out of the, out of the screen. Um, and then finally, of course, if there are other circumstances that uh, uh, might interfere with sleep, you need to make sure that they are optimal as well. So I, I won't go into treatment possibilities for very uh, specific sleep disorders today, but I would like to talk a little bit about insomnia because it's the most common problem and it's very generic uh, um, problems, falling asleep or staying asleep. So cognitive behavioral therapy targeted at insomnia is very effective. It helps to restore sleep in about 70% of patients and it's usually it consists of five to six uh, sessions with a therapist that specializes in sleep and it contains elements about education on healthy sleep and what you can do about it. So a little bit about what I just talked to you about, but more intensive. Uh, it also tackles worries and thoughts about sleep that are not helping. For example, worrying about how you will fail tomorrow's test at school if you don't fall asleep within the next five minutes. Um, this will keep you awake even longer, uh, while it's not necessarily true that you will fail the test because you didn't sleep well. Um, so um, um, this type of therapy will help uh, you deal with those kinds of thoughts that you might have at night, which keep you awake. And finally, one of the main components is restriction of the time that you spend in bed. So for example, if you sleep for six hours, but you lay in bed for nine hours staring at the ceiling, we will restrict the time in bed to these six hours that you sleep in order to increase the sleep pressure. Then as your sleep pressure increases, your sleep quality will improve. And then you can gradually expand the time that you, sp that you uh, spend in bed. And this type of therapy, you, it's suited for, let's say, uh, young adolescents and older. And it's also very intensive. You can imagine, especially the sleep restriction needs a lot, a lot of um, um, help. Um, and I don't think this uh, treatment is very well suited during anti-cancer therapy, but it might be afterwards. So 
So of course we can, there are also medications that we can use when we have sleep problems. And um, some of you might be familiar with sedatives such as benzodiazepines. And um, the good side of benzodiazepines is that it's fairly easy and it acts quickly. Um, and um, so we use it here sometimes during treatments, but they also have a lot of uh, downsides. For example, they have side effects such as drowsiness. Um, your body also gets used to benzodiazepines. So um, if you want them to stay effective, you will need to increasingly uh, up the dose. Um, and last but not least, it's not as effective uh, as therapy for insomnia. And it's illustrated in the graph here. So these are the effects for improving your sleep efficiency with therapy only during treatment and afterwards. And here are the effects for uh, using uh, only medication. Um, another option med uh, with medication is melatonin. So it's, it's your sleep hormone um, and it can help you to fall asleep. It actually doesn't help you to uh, sleep through the night. Um, it can also be used in extreme night owls. So children that are really, um, um, they want to go to bed at 2 a.m. It can help you to influence the, their biological clock and get them to a more suitable bedtime. Um, and it's also used when your own melatonin production is insufficient. And this is actually rare, but you can imagine that if you have a, had a tumor or treatment to the central part of your brain, where melatonin is produced, that this is the case where you might be insufficient in the production yourself. Um, and melatonin, I don't know about New Zealand, but in the Netherlands, it's sold over the counter as a herbal supplement, which I do not agree. It's, it's, a, uh, it's hormone therapy. Um, and the problem is, is that it feels like it's, it's a very safe and easy drug. But it's important to realize that about 5 to 10% of people are what we call slow metabolizers. So it means that as you take melatonin, you will accumulate levels in your body because you cannot get rid of it fast enough. And uh, when, it's, when the level of melatonin goes too high, then you will, after initial success with melatonin, you will see that sleep problems come back because uh, the melatonin will no longer have the circadian rhythm that it's supposed to have. And also to realize is that we don't know about the long-term effects of the use of melatonin. So what can we do as healthcare professionals in the hospital environment is uh, first of all, take into account that sleep is an essential part of, uh, of uh, uh, being ill and getting better. So uh, I always advocate for um, doctors and nurses to try to uh, uh, be mindful of sleep. Um, we, could, uh, we should think about light and dark because a lot of hospitals have a lot of lights on at night because of course the nurses need to see what they're doing but um, uh, there are options to uh, uh, make the environment a bit darker at night to uh, support better sleep. Um, and we, uh, we should also think about the uh, environmental noises in the hospital. So this is a picture of our hospital where you see the infusion pumps. Uh, I, we, um, here in the Netherlands, we built a new hospital for all children with cancer and it opened two years ago. So everything is brand new and we were able to uh, uh, make holes in the wall, as you can see here through which we can put the, the, the lines, the IV lines. So the, the infusion pumps are actually not in the patient's room, so that they won't be awoken by um, electronic noises. But of course, this is not always possible, but we also know that earplugs are very effective. So that could be an easy and, and low cost solution. So don't forget about yourself as parents, because as I showed you before, we need, the, the children need the parents to be, um, to be there for them. So we did a study on uh, parents uh, when uh, I still worked in Amsterdam and we included 352 moms and dads 
and their ch children were on average uh, three years after diagnosis. And we actually looked at um, our parents, do they have sleep problems and are they distressed? Um, because we thought if you are distressed, you're prone to getting sleep problems. And if you have sleep problems, you're prone to be distressed. So this is the perpetuating factor for experiencing sleep problems. So what you see here, and I think that is good news, it, is that half of the parents did not report sleep problems and they also did not report distress. So that's the good news. Uh, unfortunately, uh, about 10% of parents still reported sleep problems, even though they were quite some time after the, the, the peak in uh, the illness of their child. And 13% reported a lot of distress and about a quarter of, pro of parents reported both. And, um, and so I always use this graph to show my colleagues that we should also ask you as parents how you are doing, because you are essential in uh, uh, making uh, things well for your child. So um, I think my main messages are that good sleep is essential for optimal health and that the first step in the treatment of any sleep problem is establishment of healthy sleep habits, and that you need well-rested well parents to teach a child healthy sleep habits. Um, I would like to zoom in a little bit. Uh, some of you have sent in questions, um, so I just wanted to zoom, zoom in on them, and then afterwards um, um, I'll be, we can discuss any questions you might have. So what can you do if your child wakes through the night? Well, first of all, um, make your child feel safe. So a comfortable environment, any uh, um, uh, special items that make them feel uh, um, uh, comfortable. Um, here as well, just as uh, for going to bed, you need regularity. So you need to establish a routine about what you do when your child wakes in the night and you need to be consistent because it's important for their bodies to know that this is what happens and then I can go back to sleep. So no fun stuff, even though your child might be ready to go in the middle of the night and have fun and do stuff, um, it's not time for fun. So you need to make it as boring as possible and be consistent. And you might also wonder, does my child have enough sleep pressure? So. Sometimes you need to consider bringing them to bed later or to be more physical active during the day, but not too soon, to, not too close to bedtime. If your child has difficulty falling asleep, it's actually the same. So make them feel safe, establish a routine to help the body recognize the fact that it's time to go to bed and be consistent. Um, and um, sometimes you will also need a little bedtime fading. So if your child is awake for a really long time before they fall asleep, you've done everything you can to, um, to establish the healthy sleep habits. Sometimes it helps to uh, postpone bedtime and put them to bed at the time that he or she normally falls asleep, because then you will have more sleep pressure. And if you're successful, then you can gradually advance bedtime by about 15, 15 minutes uh, every three or five days. So it will take you a little time, but it's all about resetting your biological clock. And if you do it gently and slowly, you will be able to uh, um, advance bedtime. And if your child has difficulty falling asleep on his or her own, again, make them feel safe, establish a routine, be consistent. Um, this is sometimes, it's, it's very, uh, it can be very stressful or very uh, frustrating. Um, and there are different approaches to helping children fall asleep on their own. Um, so some people advocate doing cold turkey. So the, um, stopping, stop being there for them to fall asleep and uh, let them cry. Um, but it's just not always something that's very easily done. So you can also gradually uh, decrease your presence. So if you started out cuddling your child to sleep, then uh, start by sitting on the bed with them without cuddling them. And then after a couple of days, you will sit next to the bed 
And if that goes a little bit better, then you will sit next to the door and, and so on and so on. So you gradually decrease your presence. Um, but all these interventions, they ask a lot of patience and uh, tolerance from you as a parent. So um, if at all possible, try to start this out when you feel rested and well. That was uh, what I wanted to tell you today. So um, if there are any questions. If anyone wants to ask additional questions, um, you can use the chat function down at the bottom. Um, otherwise, um, if you feel that you, um, your questions that you sent in were answered through the presentation, um, um, then we, you know, we can kindly say thank you to um, Dr. Raffaele today for your presentation. So yeah, just putting up there, I've got a question here. I was just wondering if you can test melatonin levels. Thanks, yes, Ricky. Can. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can test overall melatonin levels. You can do that by drawing blood or by even by examining urine. Uh, but sometimes it's more. Um, uh, sorry, looking for the right word. Um, you will get more information um, if you can uh, see how melatonin rises in the evening. So melatonin has this circadian rhythm, so it rises somewhere at the beginning of the evening and when it reaches a peak, that's when you're uh, at the optimal moment to uh, fall asleep. And sometimes you want to know at what time does this rise start and does the rise go high enough? And it's something that you can also do in saliva. So children have to chew on a, on a, a specific cotton a swab. Uh, every hour for let, let's say about five hours around the time that you expect the melatonin level to rise. That can really help you to see is there a normal rise, a normal circadian rhythm and what levels do it, does it rise to. Sorry, Raphael, we've got the, a question from Paul. Um, how do we know if the sleep problems are caused by medication or trauma? Um, and uh, do you mean uh, medication from the anti-cancer anti treatment? Yes. Yes. Um, there, besides radiation to the part of the brain that regulates sleep um, and the acute effects of uh, corticosteroids, so uh, mainly dexamethasone. Um, as far as we know right now, um, um, there is no direct relationship of medication, anti-cancer medication to the sleep regulatory system, which doesn't mean that there cannot be an association between certain medications and sleep, but it might go through other complications of medication. So if you get really nauseous from certain medication, it will also impact sleep. And if you get, if, if it uh, causes pain, uh, it can of course affect sleep. Um, I think the trauma question, and I'm assuming you mean psychotrauma, um, and that's a good question that we haven't yet totally explored. Um, we know that the majority of children, they're able to cope with this uh, uh, big life event that is cancer fairly well. So most children are able to process that. We don't see a lot of uh, uh, sleep problems with nightmares that you might as expect uh, if, if there was a, a, a trauma. Uh, but we know, especially from our studies in teenagers, that worrying and, and um, 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 sorry, sometimes I have trouble finding the right word, but thinking about uh, uh, big problems when you're trying to fall asleep is something that we see in our teenagers. Um, so uh, it helps to uh, uh, discuss with them 
um, if the thoughts that they have, are they realistic? And if they are, what can you do about them? So in teenagers that are prone to worrying, there are multiple um, um, tricks that can help them to worry uh, to start to worry less or to worry at other times of the day. So worrying during the day uh, might uh, at a specific moment and not at night. You can teach them tricks to uh, to um, um, let it disturb their sleep less. Does this answer your question a little bit? Awesome. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lindley. And in, in older children who who know they can fall asleep on their own, twelve years old, but won't let themselves fall asleep until mum is present. What ideas for older ones? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I I would I would do the same as for younger ones. So. Um, they might, even if they, they knew how to fall asleep, they might to re-find the confidence to do so. So uh, gradually uh, decreasing your presence might also help for uh, older children. They need to re-find their, um, um, the, their autonomy. Does that help? Because it's difficult to, uh, <laughs> um, I don't okay. see you, of course. I've got a, another question. And um, yes, your answer is yes from Paul um, regarding the question around sleep and trauma. Um, another question from Victoria. Are nightmares and night terrors common for younger children after treatments and anesthetics? Um, well, we didn't find a lot of problems on this, um, uh, on uh, nightmares and night terrors in our uh, studies. So, um, um, well, as I said, um, with regards to Paul's question, you might expect differently, but a lot of, most children are fairly, fairly resilient. So they uh, somehow manage to process everything that happens to them, uh, which doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Uh, but in our studies, we didn't find uh, um, that it, this was very common. So, um, 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 no, not very common in our studies, but not impossible, of course. Awesome, thank you. And in answer to your question around um, if Lindley's, uh, Lindley's 12 year old and, and the question around her sleep, she says, yes, thank you very much. That was helpful. Um, do we have any other questions, um, parents, while well, we have Raffaele on our, uh, on our screens for tonight? Sorry, Kalia. I'm just asking the others if they've got any, if the parents, if they have any more questions for you while we have you here um, on screen with us tonight. Cool. We've got a... a um, We've scheduled this up until um, um, eight o'clock um, and Dr. Raffaele van Litzenberg, you've really presented um, such an informative uh, presentation around sleep um, and what could be helpful and, and, and also some really practical tools that can be used um, outside of this population. Um, and a lot of really um, practical helpful tips for any parent really with with any children um, I just want to uh, thank you for your time um, and I also want to extend a massive um, I've got one question from Paul thank you Paul keep your questions coming in um, our son used to sleep for about 11 hours now he seems to need significantly less sleep sometimes Do you have any, um, well, yeah, 
you know, the, the recommendations for uh, average sleep times are really average sleep times. So there's a lot of in individual um, variability. So if your son does fine with less sleep, so if he does well during the day and he feels energetic enough, um, then um, um, there, there, there's no problem there. So I think that's the most important part about sleep and sleep problems. Do they, do they cause problems either during the day? Ah, I see Paul is still saying mm. that. Yep. That's okay. Paul sent the question in um, half and half. So for our other parents, I'll reread that question, eh, Raffaele, um, in full. Um, our son used to sleep for about 11 hours. Now he seems to need significantly less sleep, sometimes waking up at 4 a.m. due to babies waking him and he cannot go back to sleep. How can we support our children to end up, you know, to feel rested again, to be able to go back to sleep again? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the environment. Um, so it's difficult, of course, with uh, young babies in the house. Um, I'm assuming that he has, um, so you said he need because in the first part of your question, Paul, you said he needs less sleep, uh, but apparently he wakes early and that causes a problem. Um, is it a problem for him or is it a problem for the family, which is also important because if you have one child walking about at 4 a.m., that might also pose a problem. Um, did you try giving him earplugs? Mm -hmm. Well, in response to Paul, um, that it's it's a problem, of course, uh, if if he wakes up at four for the whole household. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I think I would be very practical and see um, if, if uh, earplugs might be a solution. Most children tolerate them well and they really block out a lot of, they can block out a lot of noise. Um, and otherwise, I would say um, 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 try to make a routine out of it. Uh, so that his body will get used to the fact that, okay, it might be 4 a.m., but I still need to go back to sleep. So no fun stuff. Uh, make it boring and uh, try to help him find cues for his body to understand that it's still nighttime. So keep it uh, dark. Um, and uh, it's a problem because it's, it's an outside influence. So um, maybe try the earplugs. Awesome. Uh, and we've got a question from Lindley. Our daughter averages nine to 10 hours sleep at night, but constantly tired during the day. She comes home from school exhausted every day. Is this just due to the type or grade of cancer she has? Well, being, being tired. So um, there's a, um, um, there's a difference between being tired and being sleepy <clears throat> and it's sometimes it's it's difficult to uh, to uh, figure it out if you're sleepy you can fall asleep at inappropriate moments or inappropriate times um, <clears throat> if you're tired um, you're not necessarily falling asleep but you feel fatigued and um, it's important to make this distinction because if you're very sleepy and you fall asleep where you shouldn't then um, it's, it's, it's worth having a, a closer look at, at how she sleeps. So even though she sleeps nine or 10 hours, um, the sleep quality might be uh, poor. She, maybe she wakes up often at night, just very briefly. So she won't have any recollection, but, uh, that might still impact your sleep quality. And if she's very tired, so very fatigued, 
uh, this can, I don't know what type of cancer your, your daughter has, but, um, and if she still receives treatment or not, uh, but that's a whole different array of potential uh, um, uh, factors that influence, influence how fatigued you are. So it's, it's, sometimes it's difficult to disentangle sleep from fatigue. Awesome. I have another question um, around like the positioning of sleep. So um, if a child constantly goes to sleep in a fetal position, is that something that we should be concerned about? No, no. I, I think sleep position, um, as long as the child um, is comfortable and it can breathe well, of course, then a fetal position is no problem or the some children sleep with their butts up in the air. It's all, uh, it's, 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 it's just a way for them to get comfortable. So um, it doesn't ring any bells, alarm bells for me. Mm -hmm. And I guess around um, like hyperactivity and um, being quite hyper during the day, as you've mentioned already, um, helping your child to, to teach them ways to uh, wind down, regulating their uh, sleep patterns and all of that kind of stuff and physical activity well before bedtime. If, you, if we continue to keep all of those things consistent, then that would support a child to get to sleep better and ease off, you know, kind of feel more relaxed. Sorry, Billy, can you repeat? Yeah, sorry. So I've just got a question around um, supporting a child to fall asleep and they're quite, quite active or hyperactive throughout the day. Um, and a parent's just wondering around how can you support your child to, to be able to wind down and sleep better? Um, I'm just taking from your presentation and the suggest practical suggestions that you have mentioned around um, helping your body to regulate, to get back to sleep. Um, physical activity should be before bedtime. Um, dimming the light. So everything that you've talked about, really, um, to be more practical and cons consistent to support your child to kind of wind down and relax and, and, and avoid those hyperactivity normal behaviors that they would have before should be quite helpful so I thought I'd read out that one question to you anyway that I had um which you've really answered through the presentation anyway yeah mm. um and Lynn Lee's come through thanks Lynn for your question um the diagnosis is grade four and excuse if I can't pronounce this one um glioblastoma with an IDH wild type currently no treatment that can help her Thank you for information on the tiredness and sleepiness that is interesting and also thinking about waking at night that she's not aware of. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Lindley. Any last minute questions, um, thoughts or comments um, for our awesome presenter tonight? Yeah. Are you happy, um, Raphael, if we can access the slides um, just to support our families to have the information? Yeah. yeah, I think you're recording it, right? Oh, do. Yes, I am. I am recording it. Sorry, yeah. guys, I'm old school with all of this technology <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, we are recording this. Thank you for the reminder. Um, and we will be posting this to our CCF um, website. Um, and if you check it out already, there's some past webs, uh, webinars that we've had, and this one is obviously going to be added to that. Yeah, any, any last takers? I'm going to do a live auction. Going <laughs> once, going twice. All right, lovely. Um, thank you so much again. Um, for joining us tonight and um, sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. 
there, there's some really helpful tips um, and, and I just wish our, our parents also um, all the best with being able to implement some wonderful practical suggestions and tools um, and, and to improve the sleep in your child and also in, in yourselves as parents. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Raphael van Litzenberg for imparting some knowledge to us and uh, the parents here in New Zealand. And uh, we wish you all the best in the Netherlands and the current climate um, that the world is facing today with uh, COVID-19. Um, and again, guys, we will have another webinar. Um, all the information will be sent out to you um, in a couple of months. But to look out for our this awesome sleep webinar, which we'll be posting on our CDCF page. Um, and that's us for tonight. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome, guys. It was my pleasure. Hopefully, we'll see each other again. Oh, you've got to come down here. Oh, I, I would love to. <laughs> Maybe one day. One Thank day. You. Thank okay. you so Thank much. You, All right. Bye bye. Good night.